Hello everyone and once again a very warm welcome to Eastbourne Central U3A video talks. My talk today is about the uh, 1936 Berlin Olympics, highly controversial and sometimes called Hitler's Games. The Olympics have been an interest of mine since I was a 12 year old and watched the Olympic torch relay on its way to the old Wembley Stadium at London in 1948, often referred to as the Austerity Games. Now, the talk will last about an hour, but uh, you can view it all in one go. But um, because the, the last half of the talk concerns um, little interesting, in many cases remarkable stories, uh, you can pick this up and put it down. You also don't need to be sporty to find it of interest and enjoy it. Well, the first slide you can see is three great images of Berlin, a very interesting and uh, vibrant city, uh, especially since the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. You see on the left here the Reichstag, which was actually burned down in 1933, just as the Nazis came to power, and they accused the communists of doing it. There's no actual proof that that happened. In the middle, you see the top of the Brandenburg Gate with the quadriga, the four-horse-drawn chariot of victory, and on the right, um, Berlin Cathedral, the Grand Berlin Cathedral. Uh, the oldest uh, um, artifact here is the Brandenburg Gate, which was built in 1788, and the quadriga added about five years later. The splendid Baroque Cathedral, in fact, started to be built in 1895 and took nearly 10 years to build. But we need to move to the controversial games themselves. Now, there have been quite a number of uh, pretty controversial games. In uh, 1972, um, Palestinian terrorists murdered some Israeli athletes, which rather marred that games. In 1976, um, a number of African countries, uh, headed by President Rari of Tanzania, boycotted the Games in Montreal because um, the New Zealand All Blacks team had toured South Africa, and at that time apartheid was still in operation. And then because Russia invaded Afghanistan in uh, uh, 1979, um, the Americans um, boycotted the Russian 1980 games in Moscow. Uh, and of course, the, Rus the Americans later <laughs> invaded Afghanistan themselves. And then, as a sort of reprisal, um, the Russians boycotted the 84 games in Los Angeles. Well, of course, this was one of the most spectacular games in many ways. It was a wonderful propaganda exercise. Before Hitler came to power in 1933, um, and just to say that the Games were given to Berlin in 1931 by the International Olympic Committee before Hitler came to power with the promise of economic um, development uh, after World War I, and of course the Great Depressions in the late 20s, early 30s. Well, um, funnily enough, Berlin was going to be the venue for the 1916 Games. And after the 1912 Games in Stockholm, these two gentlemen would have looked a lot younger than in this picture, were given the um, task of organising those games. But of course, um, World War I intervened and the games were cancelled. And when the next game in, games in 1920 at Antwerp um, took place, the Germans were actually banned from competing there because they were regarded as the instigators of the First World War. They were also banned for the 1924 Paris Games, but were reinstated um, 
1928 for the Amsterdam Games. Now these two gentlemen, Theodore Liewald and Carl Diem, um, were great organisers. Uh, Liewald had a legal background and both of them were uh, quite high-ranking civil servants. Um, Diem had actually been quite a good athlete in his time as well. But um, with the um, accession of Hitler and the Nazi party in 1933, um, the Jews got a, a raw deal, as did quite a number of other people. And um, with the 1935 Nuremberg Laws, um, people started to uh, be defined according to their Jewish ancestry. And in fact, uh, Liewald was a quarter Jewish because his paternal grandmother was a Jew and Karl Diem was an eighth Jewish. It makes a total nonsense. I mean, as a geneticist, uh, this is rubbish. Um, but his paternal, uh, sorry, his, yes, his um, maternal grandmother was also Jewish. But nevertheless, these two men had done a lot of work uh, between the First World War and the 36 Games, and Liewald probably was one of the people most responsible for Berlin to be awarded the Games. Well, they couldn't, there was a call for boycott from a number of countries, especially the United States and the Jewish community in New York. And, um, a boycott would certainly have taken place. To avert that, obviously the Nazis didn't want to get rid of these two people despite tracing Jewish ancestry to them. Instead, they um, had these two gentlemen, both members of the Nazi party, um, Hans von Schammer und Osten, the man on the right here, was uh, put in charge of all German sport. And so he had the most power in Germany. But for the most part, these two, who had some good ideas as well, got on with the job. Uh, the other man, Karl Ritter von Holt, was a member, the German member of the International Olympic Committee. And because of concerns from America in particular about the uh, Jewish situation, uh, Avery Brundage, who's in charge of the American Olympic team, and who aspired to be president of the international Olympic team, he wasn't then, um, and was a friend of uh, Karl Ritter's, went to Berlin, and here is Avery Brundage. The two had actually competed um, in the 1912 games at, uh, at uh, Stockholm. So that was the situation, but nevertheless, um, there was a lot of... Um, controversy and insistence on a boycott. There were a number of things that prevented it. Uh, one of them was that the black American athletes uh, said it was hypocritical of the Germans to actually uh, uh, criticize uh, uh, cri the Americans to criticize the Germans because of the attitude that many Americans, particularly in the South, had towards the black people who were very much second-class citizens and segregated, just as in the same way the Jews were segregated in uh, Germany. And uh, Brundage decided to pay a visit to Berlin on his, of his own accord, and he linked up with his uh, friend, Karl Ritter, who showed him round all the best bits of Germany and wined and dined and everything else, and he thought Berlin was a splendid venue. And indeed, there were a number of others, because if we look at the, uh, this is a situation, this was the official Olympic poster that was put out by the International Olympic Committee. The Germans preferred this one because it has a swastika in it. But if we go back 84 years, and I was born two weeks after the Games in Berlin in the early August, um, and look at the street scenes then, one of the things that is especially noticeable is the swastika banners that were everywhere. They outnumbered the Olympic rings of the five Olympic uh, continents. Um, but the Germans were on their best behaviour towards all visitors and particularly towards the press. 
And one American journalist was extremely impressed. He said, and his name was Tom Wolfe, the Germans are the cleanest, kindest, friendliest, warm-hearted and most honourable people I've met in Europe. Well, he changed his mind later. But certainly it was a very, very vibrant city. Uh, it was a wonderful propaganda exercise. As I say, before Hitler came to power, a year before, he had said that um, the Olympics were the uh, invention of the Jews and the Freemasons. But once he came into power, and particularly being persuaded by Joseph Goebbels, his propaganda minister, they could see the propaganda value of holding these Olympics. So, um, what the visitors didn't see, however, um, was the fact that people like gypsies, probably some homosexuals, communists, were rounded up and put into a camp on the uh, top, as you see it in the little inset at the top, called Marzan. There were about 600 inmates in this sort of, it wasn't a ringed um, uh, camp, but um, there were 600 min, uh, inmates and two toilets, so it must have been a pretty good place to be. Um, this was only about 25 kilometers from Berlin itself. And then as well, um, they were starting to build the concentration camp Sachsenhausen and there were other concentration camps being built or had been built already in Germany. So that's what the tourist did not see. Well, if we look at the Brandenburg Gate today, well, this picture was taken in 2010, um, it's a very attractive site for visitors. But if we look back 84 years, it was a central point for the lead up to the opening of the Berlin Olympics. Um, you can see the torch relay, and this was the first time the torch relay had taken place, incidentally. Once again, all of these places are bedecked with swastikas. Um, the runner who first lit the banner altar of nations flame in central Berlin was a man called Siegfried Eifrig. He was a 400 meter runner, a good runner, but he didn't qualify for the German team. But he was selected for his Aryan appearance. The Germans were obsessed, or Italy was obsessed, with Aryan, the Aryan race, although, as we shall see in a moment, he wasn't a particularly good example of it. What you see is him coming to light this banner of altars, from which the last um, torchbearer carried the flame to the stadium and also other venues like the rowing and the yachting, which were slightly away from the central stadium, which was at uh, Grunewalde, just on the edge of Berlin. You see that the route was totally lined with Hitler Youth. And um, that was true of pretty well everything. The Hitler Youth numbered a great number of Germans. Also on the right here, here, here he is lighting the flame here. You see the Hitler Youth with their shorts, their light coloured shorts and shirts. A bit like the Boy Scouts, except they weren't. And they also had a special film produced called Olympia and it was directed and shot um, by Lenny Reifenstahl, a very remarkable lady. I said a little bit more about that in a moment. Well, they were very keen on their flames. Uh, they lit another one near to the Berlin Cathedral, which I showed you in the first picture. And that also uh, went on for the time of the games. And the final torchbearer to the stadium was this, was this man, Fritz Stil Schilgen. He was a very good 1,500 metres runner, but he didn't make the German team. And 1,500 metres, as I'll mention later, was a pretty hot event here. But you can see, once again, he was selected for his wonderful Aryan appearance. Tall, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, athletic. And we see him here coming down the steps before he was running around the track there. And you can see, once again, his uh, physical appearance. 
uh, absolutely ideal for um, the Aryan race. Funnily enough, the two gentlemen, Eifrig and Schilgen, did not become members of the Nazi party. They did uh, serve in the Second World War. And both men lived to an extreme old age. One was 99 and the other was 98. Anyway, the Olympic relay, as I've already uh, said, and the torch, was uh, the idea of Karl Diem, the Olympic secretary for the German. I mentioned him before. And of course, this was very enthusiastically endorsed by Goebbels, Joseph Goebbels, the propaganda minister. And uh, because lighting the flame in Olympia in Greece and then involving 500 or so uh, relay runners through different countries to Berlin was a wonderful exercise in um, promoting the Nazi cause. The torches themselves were designed by a man called Walter Lemke and they were manufactured by the Krupp company. So here is Shulgan bringing in the Olympic torch to the stadium and eventually lighting the stadium um, flame. Well, this was closely followed by the cavalcade involving the Führer, Hitler, uh, coming through the Brandenburg Gate again in their open-top Mercedes. Uh, it had been raining earlier in the day, but it did stop for the main event itself. Then you see Hitler coming into the stadium. To his left is uh, Dr. Leowald, the main organizer, uh, president of the German Olympic Committee, and then Hitler going to his box and giving his opening address. And of course, the uh, Heil Hitler salute from all the Germans and all the German athletes was paramount. Well, just quickly again to recap, um, the Nazis were not in power when Berlin was given these games. Uh, the stadium, they were a great propaganda exercise, immaculately timed, extremely well organised, as you expect from the Germans, and there were wonderful facilities for the athletes. The stadium itself, which you see here, was specially built. The um, two architects were a man called Werner March and a young man called Albert Speer, who was a strong Nazi and wanted to add a few things that even promoted the Nazi regime still further. On these two, two towers, as you come into the entrance of the stadium, you see a clock on the left and the Nazi swastika on the right, uh, with the Olympic rings uh, linked between them. Today, the Olympic rings will have gone and so will have the swastika. Amazingly, not a lot of damage was done to the Olympic Stadium and the surrounds. At the back of this is a big green area um, called the Mayfield. And uh, on the far side of that, a bell tower, which I'll mention again in a moment. So yes, there's the official Olympic film. And just like London, who'd started television in 36 at Alexander Palace, local television was also employed for the first time at these Olympic Games. And again, the other thing that finally took a very tight vote about boycotting or not <coughs> went in favour of holding the Games was that the Germans agreed to put in some token Jewish, ath well, they didn't say that, but some token Jewish athletes were included. And also a special Olympic anthem was written by this man, Richard Strauss, who was sort of the senior man in charge of all German music. This is Strauss of de Rosenkavalier fame, not the waltzes. He was Austrian, or they were Austrian. So I mentioned that uh, there was a bell tower, and a, a, a bell was specially struck for this, or made, it weighed three and a half tons. During World War II, the uh, bell tower actually was um, severely bombed and the bell itself was damaged. But after the war, um, 
it was restored and put on this plinth. Now, this is part of the sort of Mayfield. The rowing and yachting were at slightly separate um, venues, but most of the others, the um, Olympic swimming and boxing and so on, were in the vicinity uh, around the stadium. Well, of course, um, mentioning the um, token Jewish people, <coughs> one of the people who was half Jewish, her father was a, a Jew, Jot doctor, uh, was Helene Meyer. And you can see her here, she won the silver medal here. And she's giving, like all the German athletes and all the German officials, when they won or got a medal, they saluted. Well, they also included this lady initially, Greta Bergman. She was the German high jump champion and also the European high jump champion. But about a week before the Games started, she was told she was not up to standard and was not allowed to compete. The Germans probably did themselves out of a medal at least and probably even a gold medal because she was certainly far superior than the person who won it in terms of the height she'd jumped. Well, let's just say a little bit about Helen Meyer from Germany. Um, she was a really a sort of charismatic person. She'd won a whole number of international events, both in and outside Germany. And she won the gold medal in 1928 at Amsterdam. She did compete in the 32 games, but not surprising, she finished sixth, but it's not surprising because her father died about two or three months before the games. And then two hours before she was about to compete, she was told that her boyfriend had been accidentally killed in a military operation and had drowned. So that can't exactly fill you with the, the focus that you require for these events. But she was, in 1930, the pride of Germany. And um, President von Hindenburg gave her an award, as you can see. Well, at um, the Olympics in Berlin, she won the silver medal, as I've seen. Legally, because she was half Jewish, um, <coughs> she lost her citizenship, as did her parents. But at the time of uh, recalling her for the Olympics, she was a student in America and decided to come back basically because she did want to compete and do well in the Olympics again, but also because she thought she might regain her citizenship and those of her parents. But not so. In fact, after the Games, um, she was, her name was removed from the Roll of Honour. Uh, again, she did not retain her citizenship. And very fortunately, she went back to the States to study at the University of um, Berkeley in California. She did come back in 1962 to see some of the family that remained, not many of them. And very sadly, she died of cancer in her late 40s. Well, the next story is an interesting one. Um, Jack Beresford and Leslie Southwood, who were the double skulls winners. The story is interesting because very unusually, um, they had the same coach, Eric Phelps, as the Germans who were the favourites, Willy Keidel and Joachim Persch. And so one of the first things he said to the British uh, pair, get yourself a much lighter boat, this is what the Germans have done, um, and follow their training, very strict training regime, very tough training regime, which they did. Well, they ordered this boat, but it got lost in transit, and they looked everywhere, and eventually it was found in a railway siding in Hamburg and then moved to the uh, very anxious British pair to uh, try out the boat for a few weeks before the Olympics actually started. Now in the first round of the uh, rowing, this rowing event, um, they were beaten by the German pair. But the coach gave them advice and said, look, um, you know, the Germans will nearly always go for their final sprint at about 1,800 metres, with a total of about 2,000 metres. 
So you need to keep in touch with them. And what Beresford had also observed was that um, the Germans managed to gain a stroke advantage at the start because the Belgian starter had such a large megaphone he couldn't see around it. So uh, <laughs> it was intriguing. When they came to the final, which they qualified for through winning the repechage for the fastest losers. And uh, as a consequence, they started a bit of gamesmanship themselves. They purposely full started. They weren't disqualified then for full starting. And then having got back to the starting point, they delayed events by taking off their sweaters. And then rather than listening to the starter, they looked at the Germans to see when they were going to start and started with them. And sure enough, uh, the Germans led up to 1800 meters. The British pair kept um, with them and uh, they were prepared for the sprint. And then at about 100 meters to the finish, they also put in their own sprint and beat the Germans by about two lengths. It was a remarkable uh, victory. But then Jack Beresford was a remarkable man. He was the Steve Redgrave of his generation. He wasn't knighted because he wasn't very popular or wasn't very common for sports people to get knighted. But as you can see from this, first of all, his father had been a silver medalist in Stockholm in a rowing event. Um, as a young man, he'd served um, one or two years in the First World War. He went to Antwerp and was narrowly beaten in the single skulls. But in 24, he came back to win the gold medal. In Amsterdam, he won a silver medal. In Los Angeles, he won a gold medal. And in Berlin, he won a gold medal. Went to five Olympics, just like Steve Redgrave, and may well have gone to the 1940 Games in Tokyo had it been held. Because he and um, Southwood had won many international events in 1939, just short of the Olympics, but of course World War II intervened. Remarkable man. Well, another story. The first track and field event was the women's javelin. Uh, there were 14 competitors, of which three were German, and the, there were two Germans who were really favourites. There was Louise Kruger, who was the world record holder, and a very uh, delightful Tilly Fleischer. And in fact, she was the one who, in I think her second throw, produced an Olympic record, and that was not beaten. So uh, Fleischer was first, Kruger was second. So delighted was Hitler that when they, here they are on the uh, medal podium, giving the Nazi salute, Hitler invited them back to his box to have a photograph taken with him. And here is the picture. And uh, obviously Hitler rather fancied young Tilly Fleischer. For eight months after the games, it's reported that she visited him in a number of his residences. She was also dating a dentist and eventually married him. But um, after the end of the Second World War, uh, a German medical student claimed that she was Hitler's daughter. It was never proven that she was, but it's an interesting story. And then there were other glamorous um, relationships. Um, Helen Stevens, who won the 100 metres for the United States, was athletic, blonde, blue-eyed, and this was very much an attraction for Hitler. But uh, he tried to make advances towards her, but she didn't want him at any cost and turned him down. But there was another lady called Mrs. Carla de Vries, an American tourist who was absolutely obsessed with Hitler, got her husband to get two tickets as close to, the, to Hitler's box as possible. And then in a moment of uh, uh, spontaneity, I suppose, she leant over the box to give Hitler a kiss on the chin. Uh, she was quickly pulled away. And of course, the Hi Hitler didn't particularly like her. But uh, it, it, it's uh, a, an interesting story. Well, this is another true and extraordinary story. Lenny Reifenstahl was, produced this wonderful film, strictly a propaganda film, 
called Olympia, but she, it was done with superb cinematography and direction. And um, it involved her getting quite close to the athletes. And the decathlon takes place over two days. And during that time, um, the winner, Glenn Morris, started to build up a sort of romantic, flirting relationship with her. Glenn Morris, the Americans had a clean sweep of this event, but Glenn Morris was the winner and he was often called the wild man. In America, he was a car salesman. So the gift of the gab, I guess. And um, after he had been given his medal and the laurel wreath, um, he stepped down from the podium, saw Lenny Riefenstahl on the other side of the track, ran over to her, kissed her on the mouth, pulled her bowels open and kissed her on the top of her uh, breasts as well, which caused quite a gasp from the crowd. Uh, she pursued his uh, romantic gestures no further. Well, this is another very, very interesting story. And it's one of the reasons why I'm dressed as I am today with a collar and tie. This um, man was one of our star athletes on the track, Arthur Godfrey Brown. He's seen on the right here wearing his Cambridge blue scarf. Both his siblings were excellent athletes as well. His brother didn't compete in this, get these games, but his sister did and won a silver medal in the women's four times 100 meters relay. But uh, Godfrey Brown was a fantastic athlete from uh, 100 meters to 800 meters, but he entered the 400 meters. And he very narrowly lost to Archie Williams of the United States, as you can see from this picture here, and won the silver medal. But he was also the anchor man, uh, anchor man in the four times 400 meter relay uh, which Britain won. So you've got a silver and a gold medal at these Olympics and we didn't get that many uh, track and field medals. Well, um, at the time, Brown was an undergraduate at the end of his second year at Peterhouse College in Cambridge. Um, he was studying history and went into teaching, but at the beginning of the war volunteered to join the army, but his eyesight was regarded as so bad that he was uh, not accepted. So he taught throughout the war and after, and landed up as headmaster of Worcester Royal Grammar School, uh, retired in 1978 and moved to West Sussex. Now I want you particularly to notice the tie that he's wearing, because it's the same tie as I'm wearing here. It's called the Hawks Club tie and it's for people who get uh, blues in any sport at Cambridge. There's an equivalent one at Oxford called Vincent's. Well, to, to talk about where I met him once, I had come from a fairly formal lunch where I had a jacket and tie on um, in Portsmouth where I was an external examiner on my way back to uh, Brighton, I stopped off at St Richard's Hospital in Chichester where my father was in a cancer ward. I went into this ward, it was on the ground floor overlooking from a window out to the car park. And uh, there were four beds, one was unoccupied, my dad was in the middle, there was a bespectacled gentleman on his left and another uh, elderly gentleman on his right. Um, during the course of the afternoon when I was there, a nurse came obviously to do something with my father and this gentleman suddenly said to me, I see you're wearing the Hawks Club tie. I said, yes. He said, what did you get your blue for? I said, well, athletics and cross country. He said, yes, so did I uh, back in 1935. He said, and I was then fortunate enough to go to the Olympic Games where I won a gold and a silver medal. And stupidly I said to him, oh, sir, can you give me your name? That's very, very impressive. He said, yes, Godfrey Brown. Quite an extraordinary story. My father was totally unaware of this. And to make it even more extraordinary, as I was there, a, a Rolls Royce car drew up outside in the car park with the number plate MCC1. 
about five minutes later, in walked a person I immediately recognised as a cricket fan as well. It was Michael Colin Cowdery, or Lord Cowdery, who'd come to see an old um, international and Kent cricket colleague who was in the bed on my father's right-hand side. Quite extraordinary. I, I kept pinching myself. And Dad had no idea uh, what company he was in. Anyway, let's move on again to this man, Jack Lovelock, a man who was a remarkable all-round sportsman and the winner, as it happened, of the 1500 metre final at uh, Berlin. And it was a very prestigious field. Not only was he a good athlete, but he was a very bright guy. He got a, a Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford University and, and read medicine. And he competed really as a postgraduate medical student when they came to New Zealand. The field was quite uh, splendid. The only person who wasn't in this field was a man called Sidney Wooderson. Anyone you follow athletics, Sidney Wooderson was a little bespectacled man. You wouldn't think he was an athlete, but he was at one time the world record holder of the mile, and he was certainly one of our great athletes. He, he had, in fact, actually beaten Lovelock a year or two earlier, but he couldn't compete because he got a foot injury. But in this was the current world record holder, Glenn Cunningham, seen leading the race here. And just behind him, a man called Luigi Berkeley from Italy, who was the gold medalist at the Los Angeles game four years earlier. Jack Lovelock had finished six in, that, in those games. But he was a great strategist. And through his medical studies, he was very interested in his own particular performance and how he could enhance it and surprised them by uh, sprinting from the 300 meter mark on the last lap. And uh, this he did. Everyone expected him to perhaps sprint in the last 100 meters, but not at all. And although the lead changed places throughout the race, um, Lovelock left um, the field in his wake because he sprinted all the way from 300 metres. Quite a, a new Olympic record. I think it was a new world record as well for 1,500 metres. And now Jack was one of the first of three great New Zealand runners. Uh, Sir Peter Snell was the next one, another double Olympic champion. He died earlier this year. And, uh, and, and the other one was uh, 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 John, um, oh, can't think of his name at the moment. It'll come to me. He won the 1500 meters in Montreal. During the war, he served in the Royal Army Medical Corps. But just prior to the war, or just at the beginning of the war, he had a very bad uh, horse riding accident, which left him um, with dizzy spells. He got a job in America after the war at a hospital there. Felt not too well one day. It was actually the 28th of December, 1949. Found his wife to say he'd be home early. Got to the railway station just as the train was coming in. He had a dizzy spell, fell on the line and was killed instantly. Only 39 years of age, great loss. Well, he, Jack also had a fantastic uh, sense of humour. He was also the um, banner carrier for New Zealand and he detested the uh, Hitler Nazi salute and the swastika. And he told his uh, teammates, uh, just look straight ahead when you pass Hitler's box, maybe take your hat off. But if I see a man with a small moustache like Hitler, I'll give you an eyes right uh, command. Saw a man with a broom on the edge of the uh, track and the New Zealand D team turned their eyes right. But when they came to um, Hitler's box, they did take off their hats, but they didn't give a turn right salute. Now, the obvious star of this game was Jesse Owens. Most people remember this name, a black American athlete. And he was quite outstanding. First of all, he won the 100 metres here in starting on the right, the 200 metres and the long jump. He was the world record holder for the long jump. He also won a gold medal in the four times 100 metre relay, which I'll come to in a moment, because that 
was more contentious for a number of reasons. But uh, m um, much to, I think, a lot of Germans' uh, um, amazement, in the long jump, he made a friendship with Lutz Long, the German favourite for this event. Lutz, as you can see, is again a typical Aryan. Fair-haired, blue-eyed, athletic. The result was that Owens won this event with Lutz second giving the German salute. But Lutz was a remarkable man. He, he um, saw in the qualifying rounds that Hitler, sorry, Hitler, uh, that Jesse Owens had um, made two no jumps. And he said to him, look, he said, you can easily do the qualifying uh, jump for the uh, final. He said, if you put your, if you take a stride back, he said, I'll um, also put my towel there so you can see it from the side of your eyes. Um, and with his third jump and the last jump, he managed to qualify for the final. And the same thing happened in the final. Lutz was in the lead. But Lutz respected Owens because he was a fantastic long jumper and he said, look, again, just move your marker a little bit back. He said, and you can win this event, uh, which is what Owens did and um, nearly equaled his world record. Um, his world record, I think it was 26 foot 8.5 inches. He jumped 26 foot 5.5 inches in the Olympic final to make a new Olympic record. Owens died of lung cancer in 1980. Lutz, Lutz Long sadly died in battle in Sicily in 1943. Now the other remarkable thing about the story is that um, we met, I was a member of Woodford Green Athletic Club for three or four years in the early 60s. Very good club. And we were invited to an international uh, club competition in Berlin. And uh, surprise, this is the uh, team was there, my dear old mate Tony Maxwell, who was captain that year. And next to him is Jesse Owens, uh, with uh, David Jones next to him, one of our international sprinters. And um, Jesse Owens had come back to West Berlin to appear in a documentary about his, his life. Um, and uh, we had the opportunity to ask him about Hitler snubbing him because it was said that Hitler snubbed him and he got so tired of this he went along with it but in fact he said in, it wasn't Hitler who really snubbed me he wasn't exactly pleased as a black man winning so many events but it was our president President Roosevelt of all people who snubbed me he didn't even send me a telegram and of course when the American team returned to New York for the ticket uh, Tick, tick attack um, uh, reception uh, that paraded through the streets. They then went back to the Waldorf Hotel where there was a reception and a banquet. All the black athletes had to go in through the side door and take the service lift. So although Germany was pretty bad, uh, there were things about uh, America that required distinct improvement and it's not always the case that things have improved that much in the States even now. So extraordinary uh, meeting, quite by chance. Now this is a spoof picture and the thing that gives it away is that Jesse Owens was a student at Ohio State University. He's wearing his Ohio State rather than his American vest and it's been, the picture's been doctored to make it look as though he and uh, the Fuhrer are big buddies. Well, in addition to the Germans, um, the Japanese weren't all that great either. They had invaded uh, Korea in 1910 and occupied it until 1945. And um, there were a couple of very, very good marathon runners in Korea. But they had to compete, and the winner was this man, Kitai Song, which is his Japanese name. His real name was Son Ki Chung. Um, his Korean name, and uh, he was the winner, uh, he, his compatriot was third, and it, the uh, medals were broken up by our own Ernie Harper, who won the silver medal. Here they are coming close together in the, 
on the way to the stadium. Well, I mention this man because his is a very interesting story. At the time of the Olympics, uh, he was born in Berlin in 1923. He was a very bright uh, but keen sports fanatic. And he managed to get to the Olympic Games on the day of the two relays. And his father managed to get tickets despite the fact that the family were Jewish on a business trip to Hungary. They were not practicing Jews in the same way as I mentioned that Leewald and Diem had sort of Jewish ancestry. Both of these men actually were Christian Protestants. Now, they weren't Protestants, but they certainly weren't practicing Jews. And eventually the family did manage to escape via Cuba to the United States just before the Second World War came on. And in the States he studied and became actually a very eminent professor of history at Yale. He changed his name to Professor Peter Gay. Um, and he eventually died at the age of 91 in 2015. But um, he records his joy at the United States winning both the men's and the women's four times 100 meter relay event. And this was the American team. And this is at the, I think, the third changeover. And um, the relay team consisted of Owens, Metcalf, Draper and Wyckoff. Now, that's all very well and we remember that they won the gold medal and they broke the world record. But in fact, um, originally Owens and Metcalf were not in the team, but the American coach uh, took out two Jewish runners, Marty Glickman and Stan Stoller, and replaced them with Owens and Metcalf. His argument was that these two men were our fastest sprinters, therefore we should include them in the team. However, Glickman and Stoller had both be beaten the third man, Draper, in the US trials. So if they're going to really do it on the basis of speed alone, uh, one of these people should have got in instead of Draper. Wyckoff was a very good runner. This was his third uh, Olympic four times 100 meters relay. And he'd won every time, or the team had won every time, and every time they'd also broken the world record. And people, especially some of the Americans, and these two in particular, um, thought that the, the uh, coach was appeasing the Nazi regime, uh, rather than it, what he certainly did select his two best runners, but he should have omitted Draper and included Glickman instead. And many years later, Glickman became a broadcaster and he knew a good friend of mine at Cambridge, Roger Robinson, who, who was also a fine runner. And um, in New Zealand, he went to become professor of lit uh, English literature in Wellington University, but he also did a lot of New Zealand broadcasting and met Marty Glickman. And Marty to this day still thinks that uh, this was appeasing the Nazi regime rather than really selecting all their very best runners. Now, can we get this to work, we ask? Probably not on here, so I'll have to include it uh, when you see it. And Oh, it is going. Excellent. Good. Well, this is Jesse Owens. To Metcalf. To Draper. To Wyckoff. Now it's quite likely that the Americans would have won this without Owens and Metcalf. They had a good enough team, but this team, of course broke the world record again. Now, then we come to the 4x100 meters German relay. Uh, sorry, the 4x100 meters women's relay. And the German team were absolute favorites. They'd already broken the world record in the heats. 
and um, they had a runner here called Kathy Krauss. You see her in this picture, taking over on the second leg. And uh, she looks remarkably man-like to me and many others. However, there were no sex tests in those days. And it was all going very well in the final until they dropped the baton on the last leg, which caused total distress. The Americans who were in second position went on to win it and the Brits the silver medal. So uh, there is uh, Kathy Krauss and hopefully this might give us, I don't know, the other relay for the other one went so presume, ah oh, yes it is good. There's Hitler with Goering in the box. There's a full start. <laughs> they would be disqualified now in the current rules of the game. Here we see him with uh, Goebbels. A German commentary. And there is Kathy Krauss. Now, <laughs> I think he might be forgiven to think it was a man running. Now, this is, they're miles ahead. But here we have, they dropped the baton. And the Americans and the Brits went to take the gold and civil medal. And the Germans disqualified. Oh dear. Well, if Hitler was looking for a hero, then this man was surely one. He was in the cavalry, in the German cavalry, and um, his name was Konrad von Wagenheim. He was involved with the German team in the three-day event. The first day was the dressage and the Germans performed brilliantly. Being in the military, they were almost allowed to train at will, despite being an amateur era. And um, the German team were well in the lead. The second day was the cross country. Unfortunately, Konrad von Wagenheim and his horse fell at one of the water jumps here. He was thrown into the water and he was badly hurt. He broke his collarbone. And I think the clavicle also was quite badly damaged. Anyway, he got back on the horse and completed the round. If he hadn't, the German team would have been disqualified. So um, they were still in the lead when it came to the third day with horse uh, jumping, the, the uh, horse jumping part of the event. Uh, well, he turned up his arm in a sling and tightly bound inside. Nevertheless, he got on his horse and started to jump. Well, he came too close. He took the sling off and just simply um, tried to exert some strength on the reins. But um, unfortunately, he came too close to a jump. The horse pulled up, threw him off the uh, saddle, and the horse itself also fell over on top of him. And people gasped in the stadium because thought both the rider and the horse were dead. They didn't move for quite some time. He then started to, both of them started to move. The horse got up, the rider got up. He got back on his horse and completed the rest of the, the um, circuit with no uh, further faults. And Germany won the team event. He was given an absolute hero's welcome at the medal presentations. Well, were the Olympics a success for Germany? Yes, I suppose they were in many respects. They won more medals than anyone else. Even the United States only got 56 in relation to the Germans' 89. Um, however, despite the strict amateur rules that were supposedly in operation, 
the um, regime gave the team quite a lot of uh, time off from their work, up to six months uh, to train. So they should have done pretty well, especially as they were on home territory. There we see once again the Nazi box. And uh, coming back to Peter Freuling, he, he <laughs> didn't like any of these guys at all. Uh, Goebbels he regarded as the evil dwarf. Uh, Goebbels had a, a leg, I think it was osteomyelitis or something in his leg as a young man. He was left with a club foot and one leg shorter than the other. But he was a very, very bright guy, Goebbels. Pretty evil, but he, I think he had a PhD. Hitler, who he thought was repulsive. And dear old Goering on the right here, who he took to as portly, vain and ridiculous. He then went on to say, what does a real Aryan look like? He's blonde like Hitler, tall like Goebbels and thin like Goering. And it's these men who've taken it upon themselves to destroy the lives of other people. Well... When we went to uh, the Berlin Stadium in 64, this is what it looked like. And I've arrowed that um, pillar there because on it there are a number of tablets with the winners of the German games, the organisers and so on. So I say there was comparatively little damage to the Olympic uh, area during Second World War. Today, it's been, the track has been resurfaced in an all-weather surface in a beautiful blue colour. And the other thing that's particularly significant about Berlin, I started off with pictures of some, but this is the memorial to Holocaust victims. The millions of Jews, and indeed some other people as well, who the Nazi regime had killed. And I hope you found it interesting, and thank you for listening. I put this on because to remind you of Colin Cowdery. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Marty Glickman. Right, thank you.